Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and I'm joined by today's co-host, Kristen Palacy. Welcome, Kristen. You became a mother this year. Yes. And you're just about finished with your chiropractic training at the University of Southern California Health Sciences, and uh, you've taken a strong interest in pre- and postnatal care. I have. And uh, it's now you've been you've been on the podcast before. Yes. And you're a phenomenal host. And um, thank you. You're a great book reviewer. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> that brings me to the next thing. Our guest in the studio today has taken a long and interesting journey to becoming a published author. She recently completed a memoir titled Second Chance, A Mother's Quest for a Natural Birth After a Cesarean. She flew in today from Northern California, where she lives with her husband and two children, Theus Nye Derek. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Really nice to meet you. Uh, writing a book's not simple. Agreed. It, <laughs> it's people say it's sort of like uh, having a baby. Um, I, and I'm, you know, we made documentaries, which I also sort of felt was like having a baby, or as close as I can come to that. So um, already, with nothing else, knowing nothing else about you, but knowing that you wrote a book, and um, then also that it's popular and a great book, uh, means you're, you've accomplished a lot. But this is not where you started. That's right, yeah. You did not start um, thinking, I want to become a book writer. (laughs) What did you study originally? So I studied um, recreation administration, which is basically like um, going in to run a hotel or be in the park service or... Parks and Recreation. Yeah, exactly. Um, so with I had a minor this, in French. With a minor in French. Which is my, I'm fluent in French. Oh, bonjour. Oh, no, just breakfast foods. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Croissant. <laughs> Rioche. Mm. Uh, yeah. I was trying to tell my son the other day that it's not look. Le- it's not La Croix. It's La Croix for the sparkling water. Oh, oh. really? It's not La Croix? Y- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. <laughs> How is it really? La Croix. Oh, it La sounds Croix. better that way. Oh. It sounds mm-hmm. almost like uh, refreshing when you say it that yeah. way. Yeah. It's probably like it's better. supposed to sound. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> so. so you studied Parks and Rec and some French with the mission of going into the hotel industry? Or? Yeah. So I had kind of a childhood dream of owning a bed and breakfast on the coast, and hmm. that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, though. <laughs> I can go there. I know. I still dream about it. Um, What ended up happening was I spent a lot of time abroad learning French, and I ended up in my last year of college being like, what am I going to do? Um, And spending a lot of time in Paris, I was like, okay, I think I want to work in museums, and that kind of fits what I studied. So nonprofit industry. And... um, and then I also, that's when the tech boom was happening. So I got a technical writing certification. And um, so that's sort of like a minor. So I left, worked at the Exploratorium, and then quit and started doing my technical writing at Cisco and then Adobe, or Macromedia, and then Adobe about Macromedia, and so on and it so forth. It sounds way different than a bed and breakfast on the yeah. coast, I'm just saying. <laughs> a little more stressful. Yeah, I think that's what happens. You know, you live in San Francisco, and everybody is at the bars talking about how much money they're making, and you're just like, okay, <laughs> I guess I should probably get in this industry. And luckily, I was smart enough to have you know, a technical writing certification to get get myself in there. But now I'm not even doing that. So life always changes. You know, I think about life as decade by decade. You can always change and do something different. Well, that seems interesting. I want to, like, make my decade chart. <laughs> I, yes, that'd be interesting. Um, when did you move out of that industry? So that was the first child. So I um, I was working at Adobe, great job. I biked to work. Um, my husband also was biking to work. We had a beautiful flat in San Francisco. Um, and I'll tell you about my birth later, but in terms of the job, I, you know, after the birth, I just, I was so traumatized. I couldn't hold down a job, so mm. PTSD style. And, um, 
I uh, had some bad luck with childcare, and that just did me in. And so we said, oh, let's try, like, see if we can afford you not working. And I've been basically now contracting in different ways for 10 years, you know? I mean, just the small time I've gotten to know you, it, you you don't sound like a not working type. No, I'm not. You I'm just, always working. Yeah. Yeah. You're always working. You're just like always, you, you look like you're always looking for the, you have your finger on the pulse and what you want to do next. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I'm always wanting to do something, um, keep busy. And right now it's the book and I'm going to learn to be like a keynote speaker so I can get this message across to more people. And so I'm training to do that. And so hopefully I'll be more on the road and just speaking about this issue because it's so important to me. And I think to this is the keynote speaker decade. Yeah. It is the keynote It's like she's speaker. making a consolation yes. and like following her. Yeah. I want to learn this. Ryan's bell. Yeah. Yeah. So I had like a, a little less than a decade writing the book and now it's kind of the book promotion. But for me, it's less about being um, like, you know, I'm on an author tour where you go to bookstores and you do a reading and um, and my favorite part is talking about the issues, you know, and what's going on in the birth world. And sometimes people are like, oh, I thought this was a book reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 let's go back to the beginning. You, you, When you had your first baby, yeah. um, you know, you, you were not involved in the birth community at all. Not at all. I was your typical mainstream mama. Um, were you planning to have a kid or just kind of fell on Yeah, no, I definitely, ready. I had a huge drive to have children. Um, and I know it was a huge drive because I do not want any more kids right now at all. Mm. So whenever people break. whenever people say, I want to have a kid, I'm like, you should have a kid then. Because when you don't want to have a kid, you don't want to have a kid. You really don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then it's like past. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it started because you were ready to have kids. I was ready to have kids, yeah. And so you got pregnant. Yep. And uh, how was your pregnancy? Pregnancy was great. I was super happy, healthy. No issues at all. Eat well, exercise. Eat well, exercise. You drink the green stuff? Green, like green juice? Yeah. I don't know if it, I was green juicing during pregnancy. You don't know? <laughs> um, yoga? Are you, I'm trying to get a sense. Are oh, you sort like of what? Like... Me, me back then, what I was doing? Huh. I think I did do yoga um, at the time. Um, you know, I was, I was a big tennis player, but I probably wasn't playing tennis Ooh. while I was pregnant. I played tennis twice and both... <laughs> Both it's times. It's so hard. Well, one time I got, the first time I ever played tennis, I got whacked in the face with a tennis oh, racket and oh. broke a tooth. Oh. In camp. <laughs> it was in summer it. camp, and I remember because you only had pizza day once a week, and it was pizza day, but I couldn't eat it because I had a nerve dangling out of my face. Oh. <laughs> so I thought I'd never go again. And then the second time, I was in chiropractic school, actually, oh. and one of my car buddies was like, hey, we should go play tennis because I was looking for interesting ways to work out. And he's like, tennis is fun. You don't even realize you're exercising, <laughs> which is a load of – anyway, uh, uh, so I'd never really hit a tennis ball before. I'd only been hit by a tennis racket, so I know how the ball feels. And uh, – <laughs> And uh, he's like, "Let me serve you something, and you'll hit him. You know, hit him back to me." So I, I played baseball. So he, he hit, he lobbed over a serve, and I hit it like a baseball. <laughs> it went over the giant <laughs> fence, and then went down on the road where it hit a car in the windshield, and oh it slammed God. on his brakes and came this close to getting rear-ended. So I ran away and took the message from the universe: tennis is not my thing. Yeah. Wow. But you were playing design. tennis, which is good because yeah. uh, somebody really has to. Those unfortunate events. <laughs> yeah. Were you a tennis player before you got pregnant? Yeah. I played competitive, competitively um, girls 18 and under. Oh, wow. Ooh, Northern okay. California. Yeah. Top 10. Did it feel different pregnant? Playing tennis? Yeah. yeah it hurt. There's just the twisting and stuff was not. What about but the baby running around with you? Is that? <sighs> did you feel like the baby was playing too? Doubles? Uh, no? <laughs> no, I wasn't getting any extra. <laughs> extra boom. No. Yeah. Oomph. You, if you play with one other pregnant one, you're playing doubles. Yeah, that's so right. True. See? Yeah. Anyway, moving on. I just got hooked on tennis. <laughs> tennis is addicting. You, you Were you me. working at the time? When yeah, you I was first working. Tech uh -huh. writing? Tech writing, yeah. Yeah. 
And so during your pregnancy, you feel good. You're a, you're active, you're healthy, yeah. you feel good. What are you doing to get ready for birth? Uh, not much. I'm just doing the OB visits. So pee in the cup, five minutes. Measure your belly? Um, they must maybe. measure your belly, yeah. yeah. They have to. Yeah, have to. I can't That's remember. the one thing they do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You pee so in the like cup, a... they measure your belly. Right. <clears throat> but then you... Um, Hold on a second. But so you were planning to have an obstetrician birth at a hospital? Yes. And I chose my obstetrician by, she was on the cover of 7x7 Seven Seven magazine, which is kind of the San Francisco hip magazine. Oh. oh. Yeah. Well, she must be great. Yeah. She must be great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's the equivalent of that here? Do we have one of those? I don't one think so. Like, um, hmm. I, don't, I don't think we do. I think my wife chose hers from Cosmo. Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> That's not true at all. I think you just have to kind of look it up and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, well, I just I mean, figured everybody was the same. I didn't realize that there was going to be a difference. I thought that I everybody would just practice evidence-based birth and I would get the best birth um, out there because I lived in San Francisco and I was educated women. I was going to, you know, state-of-the-art hospital and why shouldn't everything be how it should be? Well, so, I mean... A lot of women are afraid of childbirth during pregnancy. Did you have fears about it? Were mm-hmm. you talking to other women about it? or No. I mean, I was actually really wanting a natural birth. I knew I could do What is do natural? Because it. it's such a Yeah. Hot so for term. me at the time, it was a vaginal birth with no drugs. Oh, natural. Yeah. Natu- like, really natural. Or the, well, natural. <laughs> is that French? Yes. No. Uh, <laughs> <I don't think laughs> this is, is terge. It's not really French. Yeah, we needed them. Uh, yeah, so... Why did you want that? I have no idea. I think I just um, knew I could do it. You know, I was an athlete and felt healthy and uh, wanted to just experience it um, without really knowing... I didn't really overthink it. But, I mean, haven't I just... you ever seen movies of women or TV, like where they're screaming their heads off, biting their husbands, you know? Yeah, Cousin. you know, I didn't buy into well, that. Didn't have an impact on you. Just much. thought you wrote it yeah. off as just TV yeah, drama. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I did. Did you have friends who had kids? Or are you the first in your pack? Yeah, I was one of the first. Um, I had a friend who had had her kids. She had them naturally. Um, my sister had two C sections. Um, okay, so. When you got closer, were you doing any classes or reading any books? Oh, yeah. I did take a birth class. Um, And this, the one thing I remember about this birth class was whatever happens, do what the doctor says. Don't be a hero. Oh. Was it a hospital birth class by chance? Okay. (laughs) So basically how to be a good patient. Yes. She drilled it in us to just be quiet. I have to say there are some, I think around here, there are some really interestingly good um, hospital birth classes now. They're evolving mm-hmm. over time. Yeah. But they still come with a point of view, and the point of view is kind of like we'd like you to do us what we want what we want you to do. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. But um, I think they're a lot better than they used to be, and there's some really good ones around here. So, But yours sounds like the classic hospital birth, which is, uh, you know, if I could subtitle it, it's how to be a great patient. Yeah. It was not good for me. I think that's that birth class. If I had just had a different birth class, I think it could have helped because I think I had, I knew what I wanted. I didn't realize I had to fight for it. Mm -hmm. So did you not want to like look at any other types of classes or you just after that one? I just just had no idea. That's that's just what. Class, check. check. Exactly. Yeah. Checklist. Mm -hmm. Pack bag, check. Yep. Did your OB recommend taking childbirth classes or anything like that? Or I think it was one of the ones they, they recommended. recommended. Yeah. Seven by seven. Seven yeah. by seven. Yeah. So um, when you, when, when you're, how does your labor start? So my water breaks and we. We're in relation to your due date. Uh, it was, I was 40 weeks. So. You're like on your due date? You're the one? Pretty much. That doesn't was... surprise me already about you. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. You just seem like the technical writer. Oh, 40 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember that day. I walked and walked. It must have been my, my due date because I walked and walked and walked and walked and walked and I got my hair done and I got my nails done <laughs> and I just kept walking and then I got home and I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. 
and I laid down and just got your water. Yeah, no mistake. So that's uh, my water. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Were you excited? I was actually when my water broke. I was a little nervous because I knew it fit into a smaller percentage of. Oh, because um, you weren't having contractions yet. Yeah. Oh, so cerebrally, you knew this. I knew was it not... might not be a good thing. Okay. Yeah. And um, it could be fine, but yeah, if you're already having contractions and your water breaks, we don't have to worry about what happens if your water breaks and you're not having and your contractions don't come. Right. Yeah. So just a little more comforting the other way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Did your contractions not start? They ended up starting naturally when we got to the hospital uh, the next day. 24 hours later? It was less because I think we called the doctor to ask her what that meant. And she said, oh, don't worry, you know. And we said, well, is there any risk? And she said, well, there's always risk, you know, of infection. And she wasn't really giving us a straight answer of, what we should do because I wasn't in labor yet Mm -hmm. and we were wondering if we should go to the hospital or not go to the hospital and she didn't want to say either way well that's interesting so you kind of left it up to you kind of yeah yeah but at the time we were frustrated because we just wanted her to be straight with Mm -hmm. us you know because you don't do this for a living exactly as it it turns out so now you might she just said you know come you know come at 6 a.m. So we set the alarm, which, you know, we shouldn't have done. We should have just slept until we woke up. And um, I didn't eat breakfast because I was so excited, which I should have done. Because... I eat double breakfast when I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I envy people like you. I'm also an eater. I'm like, oh, this looks great. Happy. <laughs> so excited. Or if I'm sad. <laughs> Me too. Or just because I woke up. Yeah. So you skip breakfast because you're excited. Yes, which and I didn't realize, you know, you can't eat during labor. So we had packed I'm stuff. I'm sorry. Is that a hospital policy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 At your hospital. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we had packed most. Most. Yeah. yeah. But, Depends on where. And also it's are. changing. Like now sometimes you get uh, ice chips or jello. Oh. Yes. Or, oh God. Um, when or I found out I thing? couldn't have a drink of water, that I could only You couldn't have, have water? No. I could only ha- – they said, well, you can have some ice chips. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. Is, I don't even – I don't – is that – that's not supported anymore by ACOG, is it? I have no um, idea. I think they're sure. like clear fluids. But I know uh, Whittier is actually like that also. Whittier no hospital. drinking? Yeah. I, when I was there, they could only I could only have ice chips. My hospital also. said no booze. <laughs> really? I thought, is that ACOG? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you get there and you haven't eaten and now you can't. Yeah. And your water's broken almost a day. Yeah. Um, so do they want to – what do you want to do and what do they want you to do? So at, the, at that time, um, they were letting me see what happened. So they, I checked into a room. You know, they brought me up in a wheelchair, which I, I thought was funny because – Because you, know. you weren't sick? Because you play tennis? Because you're – Well, I wasn't even in labor. So it was like taking it's, a normal person. Just a policy again, yeah. right? <laughs> I was like, okay, sure, I'll take a ride. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and I remember watching the sunrise. It was really pretty, nice, you know. And um, I think we had a birth ball. We brought our birth ball, and I just was hanging out, and my contract just started on their own, on their own, just like that, you know, just when they needed to start. And so everything was looking good. How'd they feel? Painful, super bad. Tolerable. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we videotaped the labor, and that's all, um, one of the reasons why I'm a, able to write so clearly about what, you know, what happened. Um, and one of the things when I watched it, I remember thinking, wow, I look so calm. But kind of like what you said before the recording, this recording was in my head, I was miserable. Mm. But when you look at me visually through the video, I'm just laying there. Interesting. You know, doing normal breathing, and but I was just tormented in my head. Wow. Yeah. How long did that go on for? Oh, I mean, that was all, the whole time. I was. It was hard for me. But, yeah. But you, but you, you made up your mind. You wanted no drugs. Right. Did you start second guessing that at some point? Yeah. So what happened was. Um, I think the major thing 
that was difficult. Well, there was a lot of things that I remember feeling was annoying. One, just the nurses, different nurses and a lot of vaginal exams was the vaginal exams were so painful and they had you roll on your back and oh, it was even now I just can't it's just so painful and it was like for you know a new nurse would come in and then one would leave and they'd chart so if they came in they'd vaginal exam chart it they left before they left they'd chart the new person would come in check like maybe even five minutes later right because they're on duty check note it and then they would leave their shift and it or two things. First yeah. of all, are you at any point asking for them not to do that? No. I didn't, just you know, I just didn't know. Policy, I just, so you're just going with it. I just thought that, you know, that's, that was normal. What, that's just normal. That's, also, are you progressing? Yeah, I'm progressing enough. And um, and then one of the nurses says, oh, I started to push. And one of the nurses says to, to another nurse, and this was another thing that psychologically it's interesting about birth, at least for mine, was um, when people are talking about you when you're sitting right there, you know, you're kind of in your own world, of course, but you can hear what's going on. So a lot of times in this birth, people were talking about me, but not to me. So they're talking to each other like, oh, my God, she's pushing. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my God, she's pushing. And they check me. And they, you know, claim I'm complete, call in someone else, and um, someone else says, oh, God, did you, you know, and then they start bickering, like, she's not complete, she's seven. And they're talking to themselves, and one is, like, training, so she's, like, talking to her about the training, and, you know, it's, and I'm, like, sitting there listening, thinking, oh, my God. I thought I was done, and now I'm at seven. And you're wanting to push. And I'm wanting to push, and it's I'm totally confused, and they're they are confused, and I kind of give up at that point. I think it went on for a little while. You know, I was like, I want the epidural because I was so mad that they were not. Like you didn't have any. They didn't support know. Or yeah, direction. they didn't know what they were doing. It sounded like. So I'm like, I can't deal with this. Like, if you guys don't know what's going on, I need an epidural. <laughs> and I remember when I got the epidural, I said, Oh my god, that was the best decision I ever made. And I do still believe that was, even though it could have, you know, ultimately, you know, continued to lead to this cesarean. In the end, at the time, it was so amazing to just have your pain taken away like that Mm -hmm. instantly it was a miracle i have to imagine that you know especially when you're you're done with it in your mind you just you know i see some women who just it's like tough mutter they just love it you know they it's intense i'm not saying it's easy it's the it seems like the most intense thing but they thrive on that intensity the challenge and the and, and the adrenaline that comes with it but then you sometimes see somebody who's totally done. And when you're done to you're turn off that pain, it looks like heaven. Like, oh my God. this is a gift from God. So yeah. how did that, because you said it, it turned into a cesarean. How did that turn into a cesarean and over what period of time? Yeah. So the one interesting thing that I always think back to about the epidural was when I got on the epidural, everybody calmed down. They dimmed the lights. I got a warm blanket. They turned the fetal monitor around, and my family came in and visited. And it was like the most peaceful experience. And I kept thinking, why wasn't we do this before? Why yeah. didn't we do this before? No. And every the nurses left. Like it was just lovely. Hmm. Um, and and then. I, and then they checked me periodically, let me sleep for a while, and then I was 10, I guess, for real. And then I had to push, and I couldn't feel. So before, I could feel the urge to push, so I knew what I was doing. And now they're like, push, and I was like, I don't feel like I need to push. And mm. But I was 10, and so you're being coached on how to push, like, can't remember what how they were coaching me, but it was just impossible. I didn't feel like I was doing anything. And were I, they able to shut it down the epidural or turn it down so you can feel more? 
that wasn't proposed. not presented to you. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So did um, they give you any other, anything else other than an epidural? Like oh yeah, before the epidural, actually they said oh before you they were trying to actually actually not give me the epidural straight away because I was so you were close. So close. You were ten or yeah. seven or ten or whatever. I was so close, but I was so upset at that point too. So they gave me fentanyl, oh, and that was horrible. In your IV. It was horrible because it made the pain worse. Why? Um, I, I just don't think I reacted well to the morphine. Oh. I started seeing, like, hallucinating and seeing uh, rabbits and stuff in the lights. Had a weird effect on you. <laughs> no, because so, for most people, when I see them get it, it's it has a very a big, good, calming and pain relieving uh, effect. Yeah. They usually fall asleep. Oh, yeah, no, it just heightened everything um, for me. So, actually, I even was demanding more when I, when the fentanyl started kicking in. I'm like, oh, my God, you have to give me the epidural. And they're like, but you just took this. I'm like, <laughs> I don't care. They're like, give it 20 minutes. I'm like, no. No, have the opposite <laughs> I need, effect on you. Yeah, I, I'm seeing rabbits. It's really painful. So. So, you, I mean. Is it because you couldn't feel and mechanically push that you ended up? Yeah, I mean, I, I pushed for three hours. Oh wow! Um, so I that's the that was the limit. I know ACOG now recommends four, which could have I could probably could. Oh, was that a hospital policy limit? Yeah, three hours. Um, oh, and then we call it period. Yeah, I mean that's what it sounded like. Um, so. Um, Did you know that, like, no. as the hours were going by? No, I didn't know know that at all. So but. just at three, they're like, sorry, we have to go now. Well, what happened was the nurse said, it's, you know, it's 1130. I think we need to, I think we're kind of getting, we, we should probably call the doctor in from, you know, her house. And um, is is that okay with you? Can I call the doctor in? And I, right now, looking back, I'm like, basically, that's when I decided to have the cesarean. You know, I didn't know at the time at the time that that meant basically I was having a cesarean. Um. So, uh, so the doctor was called in, and um, she had me push one time, and then just brought the paperwork and um, said, you know came, you know, she rolled her stool up next to me and she said, it's time, it's time to get, get this baby out. You're fine. Your baby's fine. It's just time. And I just started crying. And I didn't know I could ask for more time. I didn't know that I could ask for a second opinion. I didn't know I could say no. I'm guessing no doula. I no never. doula. No, but, you know, it, I just, and I was, and I started to cry because I didn't want one. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I didn't know how. Why Why didn't you want one? I mean, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have not wanted one. I'm just saying what about it was. I, you know, I don't know. I just, looking back, I just knew I didn't want one. And mm. uh, so I was sad to to give that, you know, give that hope up of having a vaginal birth. I had my mind set on having one of those. So you, you strike me. I don't know. I'm just wondering. You strike me as competitive and athletic. Yeah. <laughs> and this is sort of an athletic event. Um, yeah. <laughs> and like a goal, right? Goal, she's goal-oriented, goal like yeah. not making your goal. Yeah, I felt like I failed. I yeah, felt like a failure. I and I even, I even asked um, Zach, which my my husband, I was just like, you know, oh, no, what did I say? I said, I failed you. And I think what I was really saying is I failed myself. I asked him, I said, did I, did I fail you? He was. He started crying at that point. He's like, "No, you know, no, of course not." But I, in my mind, I, you know, I hadn't even had this cesarean yet. It was, I was getting prepped for it. You know, pubic hairs are being shaved. You know, seven people are in there doing stuff to you. You sign the paper, and now, now really, no one's asking you, you know, for anything. You're, they're just doing stuff. It was scary. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that so openly. I mean, 
It's, um, you know, we made a movie, I don't know if you've seen it, Trial of Labor. Yeah. And it's um, several women who had cesareans they didn't want, and many of them feel like they didn't need. And we we follow them through their pregnancies, their second or sometimes third pregnancies, um, hoping for their first vaginal birth. Um, and um, it's, it's hard to share it. And the reason they share their stories, and I'm sure the reason you're sharing yours, is to help other women. Um, you know, in their case, they want to help people not fall into the pitfalls that they fell into. And it sounds the same for you. And sort of like how to have your second birth experience the first time around might be a, a little subtitle yeah. for your book. Um, we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, I would like to hear more about how that cesarean experience was for you because it obviously prompted a giant shift in your life. And uh, to talk a little bit about your memoir, Second Chance. Um, in the meantime, at home, we're going to take a little break from our sponsor, but if you don't already know, we have a new series coming out on YouTube. It's called The Real Midwives of Los Angeles, and you can find it at youtube.com slash therealmidwives or therealmidwives.com. If you're looking for the perfect baby or toddler gift, you've got to check out My First Year's online collection of clothing, toys, accessories, and more. Every adorable item can be personalized with the child's name for no additional cost. Get the perfect gift for any child in your life at My First Year's, your go-to source for events and occasions such as baby showers, birthdays, and holidays. There are so many great options to choose from, you're definitely going to find a special gift that any child will love and cherish throughout their life. Every child should have something from My First Years in their wardrobe. Even the royal family, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, have My First Years in their closet. And now, for a limited time, you save 10% off your first order using promo code BERLIN, B-E-R-L-I-N, when you check out. Visit them at MyFirstYears.com. That's my first years using the number one st dot com. My first years personalized gifts made with love, made simple. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and I am here with co-host Kristen Palacy and our guest today, Thais Derich. She's the author of Second Chance, A Mother's Quest for a Natural Birth After a Cesarean. And before the break, you were talking about your first birth experience, which I think is not very uncommon. I, think, mm. um, I know for myself, um, my generation, my parents pretty much, they grew up doing whatever the doctor tells you. And I think they grew up in a simple time where doctors really didn't have that much pulling us in different directions. Our main goal was to help you and to sort of, if you were sick, help you feel better, get better. But in today's day and age, there's a lot more factors. I mean, there's insurance factors in terms of uh, liability. And so liability is risk to a provider that may not be risk to a patient. And so I have to sort of defensively make choices that protect me. Uh, but they may not be in your best interest. And so that's one of many examples of how pr practitioners today um, are pulled in a lot of different directions. And so as patients today, we, we have to be much more active, much more aware, and take an active role in the decision-making. Absolutely. What was your cesarean experience like? I, I, you started to talk about it. You didn't want it. You felt like you failed yourself and pot potentially your husband um, you know, you're an athlete who pictured natural childbirth, even though you didn't really do that much homework to it. It just felt like what you're going to do because you got pregnant, you have a baby inside you and you just bring it out. So there's this, there's sadness or sense of letdown, but mechanically, what was the cesarean experience like for you? It was horrible. I mean, from the very beginning, just going down, they, um, there was one, I guess, one OR, and it was open, so um, they really wanted to get there before someone else took it because then we would have had to wait, which would have been really good for me because I probably would have had my baby in the <laughs> waiting time. But um, so they're rushing me, running me uh, down the hall, and I just – it was so unnecessary to be so rushed like that. More dramatic. Um, and, yeah. 
and then uh, my husband was running with me and then we get to the doors and they ask him tell him he can't go in and I was like what for the birth for the, the prepping prep period. Oh, for the prep. okay and but that moment not that that's okay but right. I thought you were saying he could be present yeah at the birth. no the prep period but it didn't matter at that point that separation um traumatized me so I did hypnosis hypnosis after the birth to figure out why I would I couldn't tell my birth story without bawling because finally after a year I'm like okay it's been a year I should be able to be over this by now um so I that's kind of the second birth where it prompted me to figure out what was going on with me psychologically um and what I found out was it was that moment one of the moments was that moment of separation which links back to my abandonment by my mother so him being separated from me at that moment triggered some trauma un you know un uh dealt with subconscious yeah subconscious trauma of separation and and also just going into the OR I've never been sick so I, I didn't know what to expect. It was scary. There was the doors looked like huge freezer doors and they were automatic and, zzzz, and then when they seal they're like mm-hmm. it, you know, it's scary. Yeah. And um so And they took away your support. Took away my support. Person. So I was in there. I even asked the gurney man, can you please stay with me? This part of the book that she writes about, I cried. Uh cuz I I couldn't imagine like feeling lonely like that and alone. Um I know we're not talking about that yet, but I it was just so, so sad. So sad. Yeah. Just to, and he said no. And he said no, I can't. <laughs> he couldn't stay, the gurney man. So you have another person. Another abandonment, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk for a minute about the your, your growing up? Because it's obviously put a very pivotal role here. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that came up with birth for me was um, – my mom left her three children when I was small, around four, and what number are you? Right now? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm like I'm not telling you my age. No, 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 no. no. I would never. Uh, in order of siblings, <laughs> uh, two. So in the You're middle. You're the middle child. Yes. Oh, that's even better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the stuffing between the two pieces of bread, which is what my grandmother used to tell me. Um. And, you know, I, my dad is amazing. My stepmother is amazing. So I never really thought um, that I was hurt by that um, time in my life until birth. And I, for whatever reason, I it bubbled up to the top mm. and I had to deal with it. So, you know, it just kind of – I couldn't do anything but um, – Seek, seek some help around my feelings around my mom leaving me when I was young. And then once you're prepped, what does prep mean? Like at what point can your husband come back in? And what is the purpose of him not being there? Do you know? Did they tell No. It's no. just protocol. Yeah. I yeah. heard that also that like they had them leave or only one person can stay. Uh, I think that's becoming more of a practice. They'll let, allow one person, uh, right. like your support person to stay. but For prep? Yeah, it, it wasn't common to let them. I don't even when they give an epidural, they like to kick everybody out. Mm-hmm. Wow. I had to do that too. Yeah. I mean, this is just the type of thing that just does so much uh, psychological damage to women. Um, so, yeah, the, just the cesarean started. It was horrible. I was freaking out. I had the anesthesiologist behind me who I was my saving grace. I would be like, I can't breathe. I thought I could feel them cutting me. I heard a saw sound. Oh. I thought it, they were using like, an, uh, instead of just a flat scalpel, I thought it was like oh, a like moving a, one, oh, like boy. a chainsaw. Um, so I had these images going on in my brain that weren't helping me. And so he would sh- give me a shot of something and I'd sink, you know, and then come back up and I'd say, what happened? Is the baby here? And I'm just looking at my husband's eyes, and I can just tell how upsetting it is by just looking at he's, you know, it's hard for him, too, you know. And so I'm, yeah, and, you know, so the baby comes out, and, you know, the book has this whole thing in great detail. So, um, but the baby comes out, and they, he's 
big and healthy and um, they dangle him over me and they never let me hold him. And then he's off being washed and weighed and, you know, all the shots. No one's asking me any of the, you know, if I want any of this. He's, nothing's wrong with him, right? So, but I never get to hold him. And then they take him off to the nursery. Still haven't held him. And um, they wheel me into a closet for, re- they call it the recovery room, maybe, or recovery closet. I don't really know. Um I recently interviewed an OB in Marin, and I was telling her my birth story, and she's like, oh, I know that closet. I'm like, oh. they're still using the closet. Oh, wow. And she's like, they're still using the closet. I'm like, we need to make, to get rid of the closet, you know, because this was another thing that came up in hypnosis was being alone in a closet while I... While someone was doing inventory. That's, right. I was, so I, I woke that. up to, there was a nurse in there, but she was stacking boxes, like opening cardboard boxes and wow, putting stuff in really shelves. it's really a closet? It's really a closet. I'm just like saying like it was so small, it was a closet. No, there no, was really stuff like in there. Stuff. Holy cow. Yeah. And so I came to and I was like, where's my baby? You know, it's just like, where's my baby? Where's my baby? And she's like, oh, do you want to hold your baby? And I'm like, yes, I want to hold my baby. So I finally get the baby and uh yeah did you feel bonded connected yeah, I excited felt good. i unwrap so one thing i my sister said and i remembered her saying this was she's like yeah they delivered um my baby all swaddled up and tight and i unwrapped the ba- unwrapped the baby and you know held the baby naked so that was one thing i learned from her was I received the baby all tightly swaddled. Bundled. And I unwrapped my baby. Shame on you. And, like, looked at it and, you know, breastfed right away. So well, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that was What was nice. the physical recovery like? Horrible. I mean, I, I, um, it, I could, it was painful to walk. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I never wanted to leave the hospital. Um, breastfeeding was really painful. And then the part that was really um, difficult and surprising to me was how I think I felt pain for two years afterwards. At the incision area? or Yeah, like all, you know, around that area. When I got my period, the pain was new, That the pain I'd get. Um and I called it my phantom pain because I couldn't believe I was still in pain because everybody told me cesareans were easy and everybody was having cesareans and that it's... But for some women, they seem to be. Yeah, maybe for some people it's easy. I don't know. But for me, it was... I also wonder if it's something you want, if it might be easier. Yeah, so or that's... Or something that you prepare for more. Like Exactly. It's... That's why I called it my phantom pain. Mm was I wasn't sure if it was pain from the trauma or real, like real physical pain or a little both. What I determined was I think it was just my period had changed so um, because the pain would shift from side to side so I could tell it was um, with the, you know, the ovaries on different sides and I don't don't really know. So... Well, that this totally while. shifted your whole life. Yes. Um, you mentioned that after this, you you struggled a little, and then you also struggled with childcare, and you stopped working. Mm-hmm. Um, not to fast forward too far, but um, how far apart are your kids? They're three years. Three years yeah. apart. Um, did it take you a while to feel ready to try again? Yeah. Well, again, I had that drive. You know, I wanted to have another kid. And um, I knew I didn't want just one child. So, but then I was like, I know I don't want to do that again. And um, and s- my life started opening up. I think the universe kind of noticed they were. It was giving me a second chance. So I met a friend who was a birth advocate, and she had a blog, and she would kind of, you know, she believed me. So a lot of you know. One thing is when you tell people you're traumatized by their birth, people don't want to hear that, you know, because if if we admit that we're traumatizing women in the hospital, like if we all agree to that, that crumbles everything. Mm-hmm. The system is gone because we're admitting that 
we're doing something wrong. And so nobody wants to look at that. And I felt that and no, and it was hard to recover because nobody believed me or nobody took me seriously. And so I found that the experience uh, that, was traumatic, yeah. that it left you traumatized. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And one thing I should add is I went in afterwards and did and asked like what I could have done to avoid the cesarean. And I was told I could have just pushed longer. So at the hospital, yeah. your team told you that, mm-hmm. but you didn't know that was a choice in the moment. No. How was your second pregnancy? So the second pregnancy was good, and I was doing all this healing, and I found a women's circle, and I was going to chiropractic, and I was doing meditation, acupuncture. acupuncture. I was like, you know, I saw a business of being born, and um, I was like reading everything. I was reading. Totally different from your first. Totally like, different. <laughs> sounds like 180. I was like, oh, I guess I need to put some effort in here. <laughs> yeah. Was, was your hospital supportive of feedback or I mean quote unquote allow feedback or um well when I was I knew I wasn't gonna go back to the same um practice oh, so did you find another magazine <laughs> nope I, I moved on from that I knew this was a big deal and mm-hmm. when you know I was doing all the reading and I realized that what was happening wasn't evidence-based and I was reading I was I was reading what I was reading the studies myself and wondering why my doctors weren't reading the same studies. So I was it was confusing and I felt betrayed and I felt confused at how this could be happening. And this is kind of why I wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. It's upsetting that it's still happening in most cases. Um, So. Yeah, so um with all I got that info, how do all you All that info, I just started uh interviewing and I had questions I wanted to ask and I knew right away because one just getting an interview with an OB, I mean, that's pretty hard. So already um there was a hospital that didn't even do interviews. So I could cross out a whole hospital mm-hmm. just by not being able to meet who was going to be my team. Um, and then there was people that I could tell right away said, yes, you can try for a VBAC, um, but you have to have this and you have to have that, you know. And I was like, well, and then I'd push back and they and they would relent. But then they would say more restrictions so or different restrictions, you know. And I just wasn't feeling – I'm like, you know, this doesn't really feel – it feels like a battle. It doesn't feel like, yay, Thais, so happy you want to be back. Let's work on this. We're all going to do it together. You can do it. You know, we'll be there to keep you safe. It was like, oh, you want to do that? Okay, we're going to make it as hard as possible, and you're probably going to end up in a C-section in any way. So we'll let you try, but we're going to have the OR ready, you know? Yeah, even the name trial of labor. Yeah. yeah. You give it a shot. Yeah. I mean, it it's makes it impossible. And so I realized that I I couldn't even give birth in a hospital because if I really wanted to do this, I wasn't going to get the support I needed in the hospital. Hmm. Did you have another choice? So I had to look into home birth, and I didn't even know home birth existed before. And I, so proposing that to my husband and to my family was kind of just very, you know, crazy. Like crazy to you or crazy to them? Crazy to them, and crazy to me too. Like I had to keep through the whole pregnancy. I had to keep reminding myself why. I was doing this because mm-hmm. nobody else supported me. You know, mm-hmm. my husband's got on board and supported me and was, you know, amazing in that because, you know, he was a lot. I was having this huge person, even, you know, it wasn't just the birth. I was having this huge personal growth period. And yeah. he was just like, whoa, my wife, she's changed. Yeah. And Scary. how was that yeah. for you guys and also having a small yeah. you know, child? I mean, we were good. He. We, we made it through, and, I you know, it was a good period for me. Um, and the midwives in your area, they they do VBAC? 
or age back, I guess? Yeah, so there was one that said, sorry, I don't do that, which is fine. You know, everybody has their comfort level. But it did shock me because I was making this huge leap to even consider a home birth. And my first phone call was, and I'm also, put, you know, arguing with everybody about, no, it's safe, actually. And then a midwife tells me she doesn't do. She doesn't think it's safe. She doesn't think it's safe. And I'm like, oh, God. Am I, so I had to go, this is, I kept going back to the research, back to the research. And so I found um, Maria Iarella, who's amazing and has, you know, delivered well over a thousand births. And You're doing this research all while you're already pregnant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At what point did you start with her in your pregnancy? Pretty early-ish, early on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a totally different, your visits are more midwific and your yeah. preparation's more midwific. Yeah. Um. I mean, you write about this in, mm-hmm. in the book, but um, I want to also talk about the development of the book. So I don't mean to fast forward too far, yeah. but how does your second birth go? So the second birth is beautiful. It's How does it start? It starts, so I call um, my second baby my nine-to-five baby because it starts um, with contractions, early morning. I meditate for like three hours. Um, we have a, we call the doula, she comes. It starts with contractions, not with, your water breaking. Right. So with, you're already off on a yeah. different path. Yeah. So I was, so because I think, what was I, what do you take when you, you want to make your. Castor oil? No, <laughs> no when you want to make your water bag strong. Oh, stronger? Uh, uh, is it grapefruit? Supplements? Yes, I was doing the grapefruit stuff. <laughs> sorry, that's really well. And it might have worked because my water <laughs> didn't break. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was great. I had doula and, you know, I was going through and it, it was it was good and it, and it got hard. And the main thing with Maria was I said, you know, the biggest thing is uterine rupture. So I don't, you know, I'm not here. I'm not, you know, I don't want to die at home. But so I want you to make sure that at any sign that you see this going out of the normal spectrum that I go to the hospital. Yeah, just to to fill in that information, yeah. uterine rupture is the, the risk of doing a vaginal birth after a cesarean, right? It's the concern that that scar, that incision that was made into your uterus, maybe during the heat of labor will become so weak that it separates and the baby's not fully contained anymore inside your uterus. So um, I think uterine rupture is probably not only a terrible term, but not all that accurate for what normally happens. But it's, um, you know, you don't want to do dangerous things. You just want a different experience yeah. and a more supported experience in a more nurturing environment. But your midwife, you made it clear if you see signs that things or there's a pink flag. I'd rather not wait at home and see if that becomes a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. So I really trusted her and um, I had a lot of great support team and um, I got to a point where I was stuck, kind of the same spot um, where I was stuck with the first baby. And I remember asking her, am I going to be able to do this? Stuck mean you're pushing now for a while well, and the baby's I not coming might, down? Well, you know, they, they want you to ha- go one centimeter an hour. Oh, you're stuck on the curve. Yeah, yeah. so I wasn't, I stopped progressing. And um, and I rem- remember asking that and she said, well, Thais, you have to get, you have to be complete to push this baby out. And I just loved how she was not trying to be nice to me, you know? <laughs> she was just like, well, this is the fact here. Yeah. Like. No sugar coating. You need. To get there. To get there. And so, and that for me, like, I think as an athlete, I was like, fine, I am going to get there. And I just, it from then on, um, I just became complete. She did massage a little bit of the cervix away. Um, and then the baby came pretty fast afterwards. You were on land or were you in water? water? I was on land, yeah. D- did you want to be on land or you weren't sure? I was asked if I wanted to go back in the water and I wasn't, I think the thought of walking back to the first <laughs> to tub. The tub? Yeah. yeah, it was too much. Yeah. 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 So it was great, you know. and Certainly different. So different. And Where did you choose in your home to? I was on my bed. Okay. Yeah. It was pretty funny because we have all white sheets and when she we did had- her when she did her walkthrough, <laughs> he was like, do you have any other 
Yeah. Our midwife so. for our home birth said to go go to the 99 cent store and see if we can find some linen. Yeah. So that's what I did. Yeah. Oh. She didn't tell me, though, to put a towel next to the tub because my wife did give birth in water. Uh, and that would have been very helpful because she that step oh. out of the tub with all the gooey, you know, stuff. And my kids were all sleeping, but then it was getting later. They were going to wake up, and I went into the bathroom. I was like, oh, crimes. <laughs> it looked like a crime scene. So I was, <laughs> my midwife was like, you got to get hydrogen peroxide on a toothbrush. And so that's, you know, my brand new baby, and my wife's cuddling him, and I'm on the floor <laughs> with the grout. Away. Yeah, scrubbing away. I did a good yeah. job. But that one piece of information <laughs> would have been helpful. Would have been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of amazing that that you had this ex- this journey, and that you clearly feel passionately that you know other people are having the same falling into the same pitfalls and being pushed into the same outcomes. And so you wrote the book Second Chance, and um, it's 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 a good book, and I think it's gonna help your mission to alert others and to try to help change the system. Uh, you've been doing some book touring. What is the response that you get to it? I am really encouraged. Uh, I'll tell you just the story that comes up in my mind whenever um, I'm asked this question. There was a 70-year-old woman in the audience, so you take questions at the end, and she's and it me- whenever people read my book and whenever I talk to them, the first reaction is they want to tell me their birth story. And so I wasn't surprised when she started telling her birth story, but what she said was she's like, I can't, I didn't realize, I'm, she just was like, I'm so happy you're saying this out loud because I still feel upset about my birth. And she's 70. Mm-hmm. And, and everybody you know, once you once we put you know break the wall of oh it's fine I have a healthy baby like everything's fine, and we start really telling the truth, you start to hear the truth back, and there's so many people who have had hard experiences um, that I just am I just feel like we we really need to. We really need to fix this because I think that we are. The pain is just. It's keep we're keep making we keep making the pain over and over again when we know the answers. The evidence is there. The studies are there. If the studies aren't there, we need to invest in women and take this seriously, and do the studies to get everybody on the same page so we stop hurting. Women, we, we shouldn't walk out of the hospital traumatized. We should walk out feeling empowered and Wonder Woman, beautiful and strong. And that's, I mean, you know, that's what you see sometimes yeah. after. I mean, that's, I imagine how you felt after your second one. Yeah. And I think that's what prompted the book again was I was just like, wow, I could have this horrible cesarean experience or I could have this amazing transformative, empowering moment that changed my life where you feel literally when you're pushing a baby out, you're as close to God as you can get, you know, yeah. there, you're not in control. Something else is happening to you. Jesus you know? take the wheel. Exactly. <laughs> um, I would just also say that I think you can have equally traumatic experiences that aren't cesarean. Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of your first experience wasn't necessarily the cesarean, but everything that led up to it as well. And I also think that it's important to note that I, I think cesareans are a great thing mm-hmm. for people who need them, certainly, and for people who want them. Mm-hmm. I think that it would be equally awful for someone who needed to have a cesarean not have access to it. Absolutely. So it's the system and how we're approaching birth in general that needs some fixing up and Mm -hmm. some tuning. Yeah. And I think that strong and courageous women like you who come back from that um, experience and share openly. and then take a, a megaphone 
whether it's a book or a book tour or this decade keynote speaking, yeah. Um, yeah. podcasting, and yeah. um, shouting off the rooftops until people listen to you um, is going to change the system. I think you're going to make big changes. Oh, thank you. I sure hope so. I think you do it really well also because it's like when you read the book, you it's not even – I don't feel like, oh, it's because of this. It's just the fact that you – and I feel like what this podcast is all about, being informed. Mm -hmm. It's that you didn't feel like you had these people who are who you felt were supposed to have your best interest, um, whether or not you have a birth plan or you don't, but you just didn't feel like they had your back, you mm -hmm. know, and you felt like they were just making decisions based on things that were motivating them rather than making sure you were having a good experience or that you were understanding just even what was happening to you at yeah. the time. Yeah, I think the main thing, there's no connection. Yeah. You know, I mean, part of it was my fault, too, because I didn't do anything, you know, but that's how a lot of people are when they go into childbirth. So what that needs to happen is there needs to be, yeah, like a coach. So you're a strong woman. You didn't do anything because the system set you yeah. up to be disempowered. Right. Yeah. So I don't really think it's your fault. Yeah, or any woman's fault, really, because, yeah. I mean, you it's your first time. It's mm -hmm. not like, I think that's what's so scary sometimes about birth is you, that when it's your first time, you don't know. Like, you don't know what a contraction is going to feel like. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen to your body, how you're going to react, how you're going to feel. Yeah. So if you don't know any of that, how would you know how to prepare for it? The yeah. second time you can get the information, you are you seek out whatever happened right. to you that you wish you could have done differently exactly. like hindsight 2020 right yeah that's so well put yeah and that's the hard thing with the first cesarean you know because then the rat the it makes it even harder the next time to have a natural birth if that's what you want you know 44 44 percent of hospitals are banning um, vaginal birth after cesarean and so your women are actually being forced into c-section and so now we get into this whole human rights issue, women's rights issue, where we're forcing women into um, interventions that they don't want because there's just no one to provide them with what they want. Um, where can we find you online and get more information and just follow your journey as it continues? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on social media, so Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and then I have a website which is my first and last name, T. Thay Sturridge. Yes. How do we spell that? <laughs> T-H-A-I-S-D-E-R-I-C-H.com. Okay. We'll check it out. Um, I really yeah. want to thank you again for being here with us. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, Kristen, for joining me and for all your work in um, bringing this book apart and um, analyzing it and getting all the juicy details out of it. Um, for our listeners, thank you for listening. And uh, you can find more information at informedpregnancy.com. And if you have any questions, always feel free to write to us, info at informedpregnancy.com. <laughs>